Hey, we are going through this six-week series on She Is, featuring various uh, characters from uh, Scripture who all happen to be women. Remember, this is a series for women to be encouraged and emboldened in who God made, made you to be, but also it's a series for men so that you can encourage the women in your life, your wives, your sisters, your mothers, your daughters. And so we wanted to have, uh, we thought, you know what, if we, if we go through this series talking about women, it would be really nice to hear about women from a women's perspective. And so today is one of those days, and uh, I'm going to introduce to you uh, Katie. I, have a, I, I wrote down all the information because it's really important to, to hear, but she is from the Los Angeles area. Uh, she leads both women's ministries, interns, and life groups at Fellowship Monrovia, and she is the, uh, uh, the, the wife of her husband, Danny, and they have a little two-year-old girl. I found out this morning she's two. Her name is Gracie June. And if you're just going by the name alone, I'll bet you she's super cute, right? Gracie June, how does it get any better than that? So what I'd like you to do is give a big, warm expedition welcome to Katie. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks, Katie. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good morning, expedition. Good morning. It is a privilege to be here this morning. Man, Payson is beautiful. I'm not going to tell anyone. Do you want me to keep it a secret in L.A.? Okay, I won't tell anyone. I'll keep it to myself. Just my husband and I will come back. I d arrived, and then I drove here at sunset. And it was so pretty that I didn't need music. Do you ever have that happen in the car? It's like the sun was setting, and there was like a thousand cactuses. It was like, I felt like I was driving in a car commercial, like the commercial, you know? It was just so beautiful. It's such a privilege and an honor to be be here this morning. Um, we have some random mutual connections, um, and I've been watching your series, and I've just been praying for this church. I love the local church. The local church is God's plan A, and there isn't a plan B. Um, the local church is where God said, this is my bride. This is where my people are going to come together. We're going to make my name great among the nations. So we get to be together just celebrating that the local church is all over. That's one of my favorite things about what I get to do is that I get to be in my local church and then go visit another local church, and it's super similar. Right? We're like all worshiping the same God and doing the same thing, and God is moving in big, big ways. So I'm so privileged to be here this morning. Let's open up with a word of prayer. God, thank you that your presence is already here. Thank you for that time of worship, Father. Thank you that we get to bless your name. Thank you, Father, that your word does not return void. Thank you, Father, that it is faithful and tried and true. And so, God, we come before you this morning asking, would you speak, God? Would you share truth and words of wisdom from your daughter, Hagar, this morning? Father, would your presence eliminate distractions here? Would we focus not on ourselves or the words, but, God, on you and your spirit alone? Thank you, God, that you are a God who has been moving in all of human history through women. Father, would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear and a fresh perspective this morning. Thank you that you are faithful and you are good and that we get to bless your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are in a series, um, and I love this, this subline you guys have been working with. When an ordinary woman encounters an extraordinary God, she is dot, dot, dot. When an ordinary woman encounters an extraordinary God, this morning we are going to talk about how when an ordinary woman, Hagar, encounters an extraordinary God, she is seen. She is seen. Maybe for the first time, maybe for the first time in a long time, she is seen. We're going to be in the book of Genesis chapter 16. I'll give you guys a second to find that in your Bibles. Thankfully, it's right towards the front. Genesis, first book, 16 chapters in. We're going to be talking about a woman who is completely lost. Do you guys remember when you used to be able to get lost? Does anyone remember that time? Um, I started to drive after uh, the internet, but before smartphones. I was in that little window. So when I was learning to drive, my dad would print directions. Does anyone remember this time? You'd like map quest something and then you'd go to the car with a stapled packet, right? And then you'd walk to the car and lay it down and then you'd like, as you're driving, read, I guess, right? Is that what happened? And then you're trying to find your way. And then before that, when I was learning to drive, I would get lost and then, I mean, what would you used to do when you'd get lost? You just pull over. And then you go into somewhere and you say, help me. 
I'm lost. And then they say, well, where are you going? And then you say, I think this way. And then they say, okay, and you, they say, like, this thing, this thing, left, right, right. You write down a bunch of directions and go back to your car. It used to be very hard, right? And even before that, I remember driving with my family. We'd get super lost. My dad would pull over, and then he'd pull out a book, a big book. And he would lay it on the front, and he'd say, like, D47, C9. I think it was called the Thomas Guide, right? And then he'd find us and then have to find on it where we're going. And then he'd have to draw with a pen, a line, right? It used to be incredibly confusing. We used to get lost all the time as people. I I remember the feeling vividly of being a teenager and driving around and just being totally lost. Like, I don't know where I am. I don't know. I don't have a navigation point. I have to pull over, walk into a mall crying and say to someone, I don't know where I am. I'm lost. Help me. Or I'd like call someone on like a pay phone, put a bunch of quarters in, and hope for the best. I think that because we no longer get physically lost, it's surprising to us when we're spiritually lost. I think there was something healthy about the feeling of being physically lost and asking for help that we've kind of lost because people aren't really lost anymore. But all of us are going to enter seasons where we feel spiritually lost. And we might actually have to knock on someone's door and say, help, I think I'm lost. We find an amazing woman in scripture this morning, and she doesn't know where she's come from, and she doesn't know where she's going. I'm going to read all of Genesis chapter 16. It will also be on the screen. You can pull out your Bibles. I'm more of a uh, book kind of a girl when it comes to the Bible, because my phone is 99% distractions, 1% Bible. So when I'm reading the Bible, a notification comes up, then I leave the Bible, then I just go to that app for 30 minutes, and then I forget I was reading the Bible. Has anyone ever done that? So I just go with the old book. Nothing pops up, nothing happens. It's very faithful. Have you ever heard the great quote, a worn out Bible is usually owned by someone who isn't? I love that thought. Um, Genesis 16, I'm going to read the whole story. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had bore him no children. But she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Cain 10 years, Sarai took his wife, took his wife, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian maidservant Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong that I am suffering. I put my servant in your arms and now she knows that she's pregnant. She despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your servant is in your hands, said Abram. Do with her whatever you think is best. So Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. But an angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was a spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from? And where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now with child. You will have a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man, and his hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, and he will live in hostility towards his brothers. She gave him this name. She gave this name to the Lord that spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. This is why there is a well called Bir Lahai Roy. It's still there between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave him the name Ishmael and the, to the son she had born. Abram was 86 when Hagar bore Ishmael. This is kind of a wild story, and not one that I think is super often preached, 
But there's a beautiful woman in this story who is met by the Lord and seen by him. I'll kind of recap it for you. Abraham and Sarah is their other names. When God changes their names, they're now Abram and Sarai. Abraham and Sarah, just four chapters earlier, just Genesis 12, God says, I will make so many descendants from your life, they will be great nations. They will, out new, they will outnumber the stars in the sky, just four chapters earlier. And now they're here, something like 20 years later. They don't have any kids. Genesis 12 happened, but they're living in Genesis 16. Has anyone had to wait a really long time for something God promised? And then you just keep waiting. Until you finally get to the place that maybe Sarai did, where she said, okay, this obviously isn't working. Let's go to plan B. God, I know you said you'd provide, but obviously, I, maybe, you, maybe I misheard you. So I'm going to go to plan B. This behavior wasn't uncommon at the time, that a slave of a family would bear the children of the master if the wife couldn't give birth to a child or a son. So Sarah says, okay, God, okay, I know that you said you would make a nation through us, but I, let's, let's try this. So she says, Hagar, you go sleep with Abram. Make a descendant. She gets pregnant, and then they start to quarrel. They start to fight in their own home. And then there's this, like, sad line, Abram's... She said, uh, Sarai says to Abram, what are you going to do about this? And then Abram says, do with it whatever you want. They're like arguing about what to do, right? I love little moments in scripture where things become real. Sarai's like, well, what are you going to do about this maidservant? And Abram's like, she's your maidservant. You deal with her. Right? That's the exact conversation in verse 8. And then Hagar is pregnant and scared and alone. So she runs. She runs into the desert. I always like to remember that when scripture names places, this was behind, beside the road to Shur. It just reminds us for a second that these are real places on planet Earth where human beings existed. This isn't a figurative woman we're reading a story about from like a book that's a kid's book. This is a woman who lived on Earth, an ordinary woman, who encountered an extraordinary God. So she runs away from this household, and she's just running. And the spirit of the living God, an angel, appears to her and says, Sarai, or the spirit of the living God says to Hagar, Hagar, where have you come from? Where are you going? I don't know if you've sat in scripture long enough, but God all the time asks questions. All the time. It's, it's kind of bothersome. I ask God for answers constantly, and he gives me more questions. Has that ever happened to you? It's like, God, why aren't you fixing this one thing? And God's like, why is your heart in that place? I'm like, no, God, I'm asking you for a very specific answer. God's like, and I'm going to keep asking you very specific questions until we get to the root of this thing. I'm like, oh. You know how really good friends are the ones who ask you the best questions? God asks questions over and over and over again of people in scripture because God desires relationship, not just transactional information, right? God also desires for us to know what he's really up to. He wants us to have a sense of who he is, of what he's doing, of what he's about. He also has to deeply check our motives. I mean, the perfect example of this is in the book of John, when Jesus encounters a man who has been crippled for 30 years. 30 years he has been outside of his community, hurt, lonely, destitute. And Jesus walked up to him and says this, do you want to get better? It's right there in the Bible. And the man's like, yeah. Jesus says, I just wanted to make sure because I need to know where your heart's at and what your motives are, and I want to know you, and I want you to know that I know you. So the Spirit of God and this beautiful angel meets Hagar and says, Hagar, where have you come from, and where are you going? And so Hagar answers very simply, in a way that most of us would, she just says exactly the facts. I am running from Sarai, she is mean. 
And the angel says, okay. <laughs> no, but really, Hagar, where have you come from? And where are you going? And she says back to him, no, that's what I'm doing. I'm running. And the angel says to her, okay, just, just wait a second. I have some promises I want to tell you about. Your descendants are going to increase. They will make a great nation. You will have a baby boy. This is the first ultrasound in all of scripture. You will have a baby boy. And she realizes that this God who is talking to her knows her and sees her. I can't even begin to imagine how unseen Hagar's entire life has been to this point. She is the maidservant of great people who are going to change the world by God. But she's the pregnant one. Alone, by a river, hurt and sad. And she is one of the first people in scripture to name God. How cool is that? She says, you are El Roy. El Roy means you are the God who sees me. And not just the God who sees, that's what's so cool about this Hebrew word. Not just the God who sees everything. You are the God who sees me. Me. You see me, God. You know where I have come from, and you know where I am going. I want to ask you this morning, church, where have you come from? Maybe not literally, you know, like four streets away. What this year have you come from? Has anyone else had a hard year? I've had a hard year. And it's sweet to remember that our God knows where we've come from this morning. Our God knows everything that you have been through, every hard night, every tear, every moment of pain, every second of confusion. Our God knows exactly where you have come from. He says, bring all that to me. You don't have to pretend that I don't see it. I am the God who sees you. I am El Roy. Where have you come from? And God is asking you this not because God needs to remember, right? God doesn't ask questions to get information. He knows it all. God is asking you to remember where have you come from. God is saying don't forget where you've come from. That part of you that feels hard or broken or scary or messy or that way you relapsed this year or the relationships that's broken or the marriage that fell apart, that thing that you don't want people to see, I'm asking you, where have you come from? Because I would like to use that. I would like to take the things that feel hard or broken or lonely or weary or sinful or sad and I would like to redeem them because I am the God who sees you where have you come from this morning? He goes on to say, where are you going? It's such a cool moment at this point in the passage because what we see is that this angel of the Lord earnestly seeks Hagar. That's the translation of the word found. It's such a beautiful word. The angel of the Lord earnestly sought Hagar and found her. Our God is earnestly seeking you this morning. He has found you. He says, I know where you have come from, and I know where you are going, but I want to ask you, where have you come from this morning? I am earnestly seeking you. I want you to be found by me. This is what's awesome about God. You do not need to work hard to find God. I know that that's a confusing thing to say because God is invisible. We, we don't talk about that, I feel like, enough. It's pretty weird, right? This God that we're all here worshiping, no one can see him right? But God has created this amazing system and structure called faith, and we come together and believe. But I've begun to realize in my own walk that it is much harder for me to have eyes to see God than it is for God to be seen. I have to eliminate distractions. I have to clear my head and my worry and my confusion and my concern, and I have to get on my knees and say, God, please help me to be able to see you. I believe you are here. I know you are good. I want to see you and hear your voice. I recognize, God, that you earnestly seek me. What a thought. 
I had a baby now two years ago, sweet little Gracie June. Um, does anyone, has anyone ever been through this? I gave birth to my husband's twin. Has anyone ever been through that, right? And she's a girl, right? And their baby pictures are so similar that on my fridge are baby pictures of my husband, and she points at them and she says, me, Junebug, me. I say, that's your father, right? I mean, they are identical twins. He has really dark curly hair. She has really dark curly hair, and she is beautiful. And when I, we, she was a really little baby, when we transferred her to her own room, and everything was kind of hard for me in new motherhood, it was like not magical. I like heard a lot about it being magical. It was not magical for me. It was difficult, and it was hard, right? And I felt like this was supposed to be magical, and then it wasn't. It was like I was crying, the baby was crying, I was hungry, she was hungry, I would feed her, someone would feed me, right? And that's how it went for like two months, okay? And so it was kind of hard for me in the beginning. I had lived like a very fast-paced life for a very long time, and I worked in the local church for 10 years and just found a lot of myself in that. And then how I frame it is, I feel like God pulled the e-brake on my life. I was driving fast down the freeway, and it was like, and then I like swerved for a while, you know? And I've had this moment with her, and it was a beautiful picture of prayer, where when she was very little, I put her in a room, and then I went back and laid down in my bed, and we have a video baby monitor, um, which is so funny, because it feels so important now, but everyone for all of history has not had video baby monitors, right? But to me, it's like, oh my gosh, is she okay? And then I like watch this tiny screen, she's in the next room, right? Just making sure she's okay, I also have an app, I'm like very aware, okay? But for all of history, it's like, I even asked my mom, like, how did you know if I was okay? She's like, I just went in and looked at you. Oh, that's a great idea. I was like, how'd you know if I was crying? Mom's like, I heard you crying. <sighs> Crazy. So I have this little video baby monitor, and it lights up every time my daughter makes a sound. So the light turns on, and the screen turns on every time my daughter makes a sound. And it had been an irregularly hard night. I don't know if my daughter was getting a teeth or tooth or colicky or whatever the 74 reasons they tell you why your baby's crying, right? And it was one of those nights. And it was many, many, many times she had been up. And I was tired and I was discouraged. And I thought to myself, is this, I you know when you have those moments where you think, is this my life now? This is it from here on out. My old life is gone. Goodbye. This is my life. And I was feeling incredibly discouraged. And the, the screen lit up. And I had this beautiful moment with the Lord where God said to me, every time you make a noise, I light up. Every time you make a sound to me, I light up. Every time you cry out to me in prayer, Katie, I am always there. I am a million times more reliable than a video baby monitor. I am waiting for her to make a sound. I am watching this thing like, is she okay? Is she okay? And my God spoke to me in that moment. Katie, every time you open your mouth, my ears turn to you. Because he has, heard, he has turned his ear to me and heard my voice, I will find comfort. There are so many incredible verses in Psalms that we have a God who hears us. Our God sees you and hears you this morning. When you pray to him, he lights up. Our God desires a relationship with you. He wants to know you and hear from you and see you this morning. You don't have a far off distant God that you have to beg for him to come close. That's not this God. This God is closer than your very breath and knows every hair on your head. This God hears you and sees you and loves when you pray to him. This God knows where you've come from and amazingly knows where you're going. I don't know about you, but I'm like a medium to big planner. Like my husband and I have a shared Google Calendar, right? I really like to plan things, and we kind of have to plan things because we live very busy lives. And so I'm under the impression sometimes that I think I know where I'm going, right? Has anyone else had, has anyone ha ever had a successful five-year plan? <laughs> no, these are things we make up, right? And then, like, I, I think I've once made it to February with a New Year's resolution, right? Has anyone made it a whole year? Like, these are the kind of things that we as people, we pretend like. We all pretend like we know where we're going. All of us. It's like, oh yeah, you know, in a couple of years I see myself moving here, I'm going to do this thing, I'm going to do that thing. Life is, is pretty wild, isn't it? And it changes faster than any of us can imagine. 
And God gives us new visions and new hopes and new dreams. And then God also really pulls the e-brick and redirects and silences and stills. And then pain and sorrow and heartbreak and tragedy strike. This morning, would you just hold your five-year plan right out before Jesus? Would you say, God, I really want to be a good steward of my time and resources. Jesus, I want to trust you. But I recognize, God, that only you have a five-year plan. I don't know what it is. Where are you going this morning? The angel of the Lord says to Hagar, which is a really heavy thing to say. I can't, um, I, I have such a heavy heart for Hagar here. The angel of the Lord says, where have you come from and where are you going? And she answers and they respond back and forth. And the angel tells her all about Ishmael, the baby in her tummy. And then the angel says, um, now go back home. Has anyone ever told by, been told by God to go back home and it's not good news? Right? Sometimes our families are the hardest places to love and care. Sometimes our families are the places where faith is like the gnarliest. Right? The angel says, go back home, Hagar. She wasn't expecting to be told to go back. Hagar was expecting to run until she couldn't run anymore. But she got redirected by God. And God gave her clear steps of where she was going. Go back home, Hagar. I've loved um, this series and hearing it unfold more and more and more. Because when an ordinary woman like Hagar encounters an extraordinary God, she is seen by the only one who knows where she has come from and where she is going. There's an incredible verse in the book of John. It's, it's amazing. Let's check that out together. Um, it says this. I had never read this passage before through this lens. Jesus answered them, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid because I know where I've come from and I know where I'm going. But you have no idea where I come from or where I'm going. This is what this passage says. I'm allowed to give an account for myself because I'm God and I'm the only one here who knows where the heck I've come from and where I'm going. Jesus says to us this morning, I just want you to know that I do know where you have come from and I do know where you are going. And in fact, I am the only one who does. You can plan all you want, you can run all you want, you can hide all you want, but Jesus has a valid testimony because Jesus, the only one who knows where I am going and what I have been through, Elroy, the God who sees me, he knows where you've come from, friends. He knows where you're going. Our God has seen you. He has seen every unspoken thing. He has seen every moment of pain. He has seen every act of service. He has seen every time you extended grace one more time. He has seen every afraid night or broken promise. He has seen you. Elroy, you have the God who sees you. What would it mean for in this season for you to see God and the women in your life? We're really, really, really bad at compliments as humans. We say things all the time like, I like your shirt, right? Did you get a haircut? What if instead we said things like, I see the character of Christ in you and how you serve? I just want you to know that when you made dinner for our family, it was important and we see you. I just want you to know that when you went, got up and went to work again, even though you're tired, I see you and I care about you and I'm for you. And I believe that God delights in your work ethic. What would it mean for you to call out the women in your life and tell them they are seen? They are seen. That their acts of service are not unseen. That the pain they have experienced is not unseen. That the things that they have been through is not unseen. That the gifts and skills and talents that lie within them are not unseen. And what's very important about this is, sisters, this is equally as true for each other. We, as women of Christ, I believe one of the greatest untapped resources is women encouraging one another. If we could, as women of God, realize there is no scarcity in the kingdom. We are not in competition with one another. There are plenty of seats at the table. Pull one up for your sister. To look at our sisters and say, I see Christ in you. 
I see God's goodness and grace in you. I see promise in you. You're a good friend. You're a good mom. You are an amazing figure in my life. You have been a spiritual mentor for me. I want to spiritually mentor you. I believe that God has good plans for you. How do we see one another? We don't see one another for an encouragement or for a good feeling or for hope. We see one another because we have a God who sees us. We see one another because through the grace of the cross, we have access to God. And now that we have access to God, this God sees us and sees Christ in us. What a gift, friends. What a gift. So this morning, would you trust that our God has a valid testimony? That he knows where he has come from and he knows where he is going and he knows that of you. That our God sees you and hears you and cares for you and loves you. Let's pray. God, thank you that you see us. Thank you, Father, that we don't have to beg for you to see us or get your attention. But God, every time we open our mouths, you light up. Thank you, God, that if we in this room feel lost or lonely or weary, that like Hagar, you see us, that you love us and you care for us. Father, um, I pray this morning that we would be receptive to your love and your sight and your care. And God, for the areas of our lives that we don't want you to see, God, we seek forgiveness. We seek healing. Thank you that you see us and you earnestly seek us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, we're not done. Stay here. Stay here. Yeah, you can clap for her. Thank you, Katie. Thanks. I, I feel like I need, would you stand up with me, please? Uh, and would you enter into a, just a spirit of prayer? We've been doing something every uh, every week, closing specifically. And here's what I want to do today. Men, uh, I, I was, th thank you, Katie, for the challenge. Men, I want you right now to think of a woman in your life that sometime today you can say, this is how I see Christ in you. I'm going to pause and let the Spirit of God give you a specific woman and a specific word to say that would, that would let her know that she is seen. Every man. Think of at least one woman and something specific that you can say to her that would say, this is, this is how I see Christ in you. This is how you're seen. Ladies, I just want to let you know, stay in a habit of prayer, if you would, in an attitude of prayer. As Katie was talking, I, I just want you to know that I see moms who are exhausted but faithful. Mm -hmm. Grandmothers who are pouring into grandkids. Women who are battling anxiety. women who are business leaders and really seeking God's best in that arena. I see a lady who's battling addiction. I see a young mom and a young wife who is barely getting through the day. I see a young lady who's trying to figure out her future. I see a lady who is struggling with some significant family issues. I see a lady struggling with loneliness. I see a lady battling depression. And those are just some of the stories that I see. And if I miss somebody, would you know today that God sees where you're coming from, where you're going, and would you just marvel in the fact that this morning you are seen mm -hmm. by him. And so, Father, we pray for your comfort, your blessing, your strength, your encouragement on their life, knowing that when an ordinary woman encounter an extraordinary God, she is seen. 
What a marvelous truth. We thank you for that, Jesus, and we pray it in your name. Amen. Amen. One more time, say thank you to Katie. God bless. Have a great day. See you soon.